when did you uh, find out, unfortunately, about the faith of, of Dave Sanders? When did you find out? It was difficult because once I left the Columbine area, I had to go down to Leewood Elementary, and that's where they were uh, unification. That's where the families were meeting with the kids, their kids, when they were brought from bus or buses from the school. And I saw a teacher friend of mine who had blood on his shirt. And he had said, I said, what's that? And he said, we helped drag Mr. Sanders into a classroom. And that was Mr. Sanders' blood. But the, again, there were rumors out there saying, no, Mr. Sanders. And all I knew, someone said, uh, part of that, there was a teacher that was shot that had a beard. Well, I kept envisioning all the teachers or staff members who had beards. And then I didn't know it was Mr. Sanders until I saw the teacher and he said, that's Mr. Sanders. We dragged him into the classroom and he died in the classroom. And so that was very, very difficult to see that blood stain. And I can remember when I walked in on, I could not get into the building. Finally, the FBI allowed me to go into the building on Saturday and I walked through and it was like a scene from the Titanic. Uh, I mean, there was standing water because the sprinkling systems went off from the bomb, the pipe bombs exploding. There was food on the table. And I can remember one of the most difficult things is walking into the classroom where Dave lost his life and there was the outline of his body and there were bloodstained shirts because it was still a crime scene. And then it was about a month later, they asked me if I wanted to go to the library. And that was something I have to live with for the rest of my life, walking in that library and to see all of the, it was still a crime scene to just see everything that was done and uh, something I was never, ever prepared for. Um, I don't know how to ask you this question, but um, you have been kept in touch with the family of the victims. Um, surely, I'm sure, uh, Dave Sanders. How about the, the parents of uh, Dylan and, and uh, Eric? Have, no. have, you, have they gone to contact with you at any point? Uh, I have not. Uh, Mrs. Klebalt is doing a lot of work now uh, for suicide prevention. And I ran into her one day at an event and she said, we need to talk. I have not talked to them. Uh, the Klebalt family, I have not in the Harris family. It, it They were living in the community, you know, where uh, it was tough. And so it was very difficult, but, you know, it's, I can't explain it. It's just, it's so, so difficult, you know, and like I said, I run into the Mausers every so often. And one of the things that I did is uh, over the weekend, third, starting, I think Friday night, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I went to pay visit to all the families who lost their children. And that was one of them. And some of the families were not living at their houses. They had moved in with relatives because of all the, the attention and security issues. But that was probably one of the most difficult things I had to do was going to those families. And every April 20th, I call them to just let them know because I told them I would never forget them and their kids. And so. And um, you, have, I mean, how was it like for you to, I mean, did you take some time off to recover after no. Columbus? No, do you I, work to, to work? You, to, do I, you, couldn't. You... I couldn't. I uh, The only time from the time Columbine happened to when I retired, I never missed a day other than I ended up in the hospital for two weeks. And it was right around April 20th in 2008. And I had some health issues, but those were the only days that I missed. I felt I could not be out of that building. And there were days I pr probably should have stayed, but I couldn't. And I missed, uh, when I retired, I had over 300 sick days and I had never used. And, and like I said, it was December 8th. I had some health issues and I drove myself to the hospital and I uh, was in the hospital for two weeks. But that's the only time I missed. But I had a good support system. My family, uh, my faith is very important to me. Yeah, my mm -hmm. faith. It's very important, uh, you know, and the school district was supportive of me and the staff. And and I I, I share this because uh, I'm a cradle Catholic, grew up, went through all my sacraments. You're yeah. Catholic? Yes. Oh, me. Oh, yeah. great. Sorry. Yes. I you know all my I, I got baptized at the church where my parents were married and 
confirmed and everything. And I was a member of St. Francis Cabri, as was the Flemings and uh, the Mausers and Kecters. And I can remember the night it happened. I couldn't go back to my house because the FBI was concerned. They felt that there were still there were some potential gunmen people out there that were looking for me. So I had to go to my brother's house. And for the for the first time that I can remember in my life, I was questioning God. I said, God, how could you allow this to happen? You know, what I witnessed that day, I saw one of my students with this uh, face shot off. And fortunately, he survived. But I was questioning God. And it was two days later, Father Ken Leone, who is my savior. He called me and I had known him. And we grew up in North Denver together. And then our lives separated. And we ended up, he was a pastor at the church where I'd been for 20 years. And he called me up on the altar and there were some of my students down there that were part of the youth group and some of my staff members. And he asked the Holy spirit to come down to give us strength. But then he said something to me that I think about every day. He said, Frank, you should have died that day, but God's got a plan that you need to go rebuild that community and help others. And then he quoted Proverbs 16, nine. He said in his heart, a man or a woman plans his course, but the good Lord determines his steps. And he said, here it's going to be times that you fall. There's going to be times that you stumble, but Jesus is going to be there each time to pick you up. Never doubt that. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and so that helped me. And so people say now, Frank, it's 25 years. Why are you continuing to reach out to the people of Uvalde? Recently, the shootings up in Maine. It's because of what Father Leone said to me. And I feel until the day I'm no longer in the face of this earth, if I could help people. That's what I want to do. And that's why we're doing this interview. If I can share my message to help others to never give up, you know, and, and I remember my first year, the one year of remembrance I had, it was one of the most difficult things. And we had like 70,000 people that were at a public remembrance. And I had to talk about, and this is a year later, I had to talk about a time to remember. So I had to prepare this speech about my beloved 13. And then at the end, about a half hour later, I had to come up and talk about hope and talk about just a mood swing, being able, just remembering our kids and the families and just seeing them crying and coming up and talking about hope for the community. But Columbine does represent hope. Yeah, it does. I mean, is it is it the home of the rebels? Is that is that right? Yeah, Columbine I... rebels, correctly. Oh, I love I love that message. You know, it's about you know, keep going. It's about hope, like you said. Uh, so you resumed your position uh, at at school. I think you feel like because you cared about the kids so much and also the community, you try to hold things together, bring people together, like we're going to overcome this. Right. And what happened was originally when I met with the staff the next day and there were some parents there and there were government officials, and I said, when people go through difficult times, families come together and we're the rebel family and we mm -hmm. need to figure out a way. And I said, I am asking you, I will promise you, I will be here until the freshmen graduate in 2002. And if you could be there to support us, support me and kids. And I said, parents, we need each other. So I made that promise for three years and a majority of our staff came back. There were a few just, and I understood completely they could not be back in that building. So I'm getting ready. And it was uh, the summer of 2001. And I knew I was going to have to make an announcement because I still had 10 years before I could even think about retiring. And, and the, the president of the school board and superintendent said, Frank, whatever you decide, we'll find another place for you. We'll put you at central administration. So it's the summer and I'm getting ready to go back for my uh, for the class of 2002 senior year. And I'm walking my dog and I end up walking. And all of a sudden, I'm in an area now where they had just built a, ch or a, a church sits there now, but it was empty ground. And I just said, God, give me some answers. And all I kept thinking is what Father Ken said, that you need to rebuild that community. And I said, I have not. So I made a commitment. And I went back and I told the community, I said, I am going to stay until every kid who was in the elementary school graduated. Because even though they were not directly involved, they were impacted. Our community was impacted. And they saw, you know, the makeshift memorial at the Columbine um, 
or Clement Park, they saw helicopters hovering over. So I said, I want to be their principal to hand them the diploma that I am there for them. So I was planning on retiring in 2012. And all of a sudden I get a call from a parent and they said, Mr. D, you can't retire. I said, no, I made that. They said, no, you don't understand. My kid was in the first year of a two-year preschool program. So you need to stay for a couple more years. And so I stayed. <laughs> and I you did stay? I did for 15 years. So when Hello, I- Frank? Yes, I stayed. Okay, that's amazing. So um, you stayed until 2014. That right. means my math, if it's correct, uh, five years after? No. <laughs> Did uh, five years after that. Columbine happen? Oh, no. It was uh, 15 years after Columbine happened. My apologies. I'm rubbish on math. Okay. 15 yeah, so, years. Yeah, because it happened in 99, and I left in 2014. And so when I left, there were freshman kids coming to Columbine that weren't even born yet. But I had fulfilled that for all the kids that were in elementary school, middle school on that horrific day. I was their principal. That's amazing. So what happened I mean, after Columbine? I mean, I'm sure it must have been a really painful um, retirement, pain, like saying goodbye to a place that you've been a principal for a while. Uh, what what happened after that? So what did you do after being a principal of Columbia for this time? Uh, I go out and help people. Uh, I go out and speak to community schools. And then in 2018, started something. It's uh, the National Association of Secondary School Principals. Uh, I was a member of that. And the director, Greg Wapples, asked me to start something called the Principals Recovery Network. And so we met in Washington, D.C., and as I stated, there were 21 or 22 of us where shootings had happened. And one of the things that I would do is every time another school shooting would happen, I would call that principal and ask them if they need help. And oh. so I, I started this, uh, we started this principal recovery network, and we were doing remarkable stuff. Principals from Sandy Hook, uh, who took the place of the principal that was shot, the principal from Stoneman Douglas, all of these places where school shootings have occurred and we go out and reach out to these communities. And it was back uh, about a year ago that we produced the Principals Recovery Network that takes the knowledge of all of us to help these communities when they go through things similar like Uvalde and some of the other shootings, Oxford, and we're just there to help. And so, you know, and I share my story and I think that God, for whatever reason, gave me this platform to share my faith. And, you know, I thank God each and every day. And I said, if you want me to continue, and I just, uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, I went and spoke at, uh, they were honoring over at the cemetery Chapel Hill, and there are 12 or 13 crosses of the 13 who lost their lives. And Dave Sanders was buried there. And um, I'm trying to think who else, Rachel Scott was buried there. And, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think the other, Corey DePooter. Well, anyway, father, who I'd known, said, can you come and talk to our seventh and eighth graders? So I went out and spoke and shared my journey about growing up in a Catholic school and talking about the key situation and talking about my kids, my beloved 13. Well, just this past week, I got these letters from about 60 seventh and eighth graders saying, Mr. D, thank you. I was questioning God, and now I know he's here each and every day. And I just looked up. It gave me a chance to share my message. You know, and a lot of times in a parochial or in a Catholic, or excuse me, a public school, you can't share things, you know. I always questioned, did I miss my calling by not going to a Catholic school to be a principal? But someone said, Frank, here's the thing you don't understand. These kids that go to Catholic schools or Christian schools they're getting faith each and every day. What you do at Columbine, by what you do and by the people you hire, you can't get up there and quote Bible, but it's mm. your Christian lifestyle that you treat people well, you care about everyone. Those are values that they may not get if they had someone that did not believe. And so that really helped me. And I, I look at some of the things that we were able to do. And I look at my staff they, it's their life that they lead because there's many people that can get up and quote the Bible, but is that how they lead their life? And for us, what we were able to do is mm -hmm. just like, and 
the churches, all the churches after Columbine, the interfaith communities opened their doors to, for our kids. It was fantastic. They yeah. Needed. I, lo I love what you're talking about. It's so inspiring because despite this tragedy, so many good things happen afterwards. I feel like you lifted people's spirits. You were like, okay, of, we, sometimes people say, oh, forgive and forget. Well, it's a bit different. We're talking about a massive tragedy. It's really awful. But I like that about rebuilding. I like that we don't forget them. I mean, there's a memorial, I believe. About is he is he around the school the memorial? It's a it's about a half block from the memorial, and you know one of the things that I do each and every morning before my feet hit the ground, I recite you know their names, you know Cassie Bernal, Stephen Kernell, Corey Depooter, Kelly Fleming, Matt Kector, Daniel Mauser, Danny Rohrbach, Dave Sanders, Rachel Scott. Isaiah Scholes, John Tomlin, Lauren Townsend, and Kyle Velasquez. And each day before my feet hit the ground, I said, I'm going to dedicate this day to you. And I go out on their behalf. And in my office, when I retire, uh, after the tragedy, I had this wall. So if I'm sitting at my desk and I'm looking at this wall, and it was a wall, what I called the wall of my beloved 13. And there was a picture of Dave Sanders that was there that just stood out. And people said, Frank, how can you continue to look at that each and every day? And I said, that's the reason I continue to do what I'm doing. And one of the things, and I'll share the story and I know you got to go, but one of the things that um, every it's year, <laughs> one of, I'm long winded. Uh, one of the years, uh, Every year that the kids were supposed to graduate, I would call the parents up and said, I want to give you a cap and gown and a diploma. And many of the parents said, Frank, no, we don't need it, but thank you for the offer. Well, one year it was Danny or Kyle Velasquez. And so I called his parents up and they said, yes, we'd love to. So Kyle, his parents, Phyllis and uh, Al Velasquez come up and they walk into my office and they're crying and I'm crying. And they said, let's cry because we lost him but smile because we had him and we're sharing these wonderful stories about Kyle. And so they're getting ready to leave. And all of a sudden they walk out of my office and on this wall, I had a little space like this and they come back and they said, Mr. D you got a little space there. And all of a sudden they're taking Mr. Velasquez has taken this hat off. And I said, I can't do that. That's Kyle's hat. And he said, no, I want you to put it right there that every time you walk out of the, your office, you remember how much you loved your kids and how much they loved you. And Kyle's going to help you every step of the way. And this is why I continue, continue to do what I do. That's fantastic. Honestly, that's the motivation. That's fantastic. I feel like I work as a teacher and I love working with the kids. I mean, the one thing I'm going to be honest, what I don't really enjoy as much is the admin work, the marking and all of this. But I love that connection. And, you know, um, the reason why I'm doing what I do is because they find out I was, I used to be into media. And they said, but miss, you should do that. You should carry on. And then I said to myself, you know what? You're right. You guys are asking me all this question about profession, you as if they're looking for inspiration. And I say, okay, let's just, let's, I'm going to do this. And every day I love you when they say, oh, I love this person. Oh, can you please t send my regards to Mr. Mouse, uh, uh, Mr. Mouse and all of this. It's, it's so, it feels so good to have people watching this. I mean, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to watch you and say, listen, this principle give is all until you know, the time came to retire, he gave his all to his kids, never giving up. I mean, technically you could have, should have taken time off to recover about this, but you say, no, I can't. Those kids need, need me, need somebody to put them up. And I read a bit about Kyle Velasquez, is that correct? Is that, yeah, so, you know, I don't, I don't know him personally, but apparently he wasn't really aware what's going on. I think a lot of people were hiding, but he wasn't apparently aware of what's happening. Is he? He had? Uh, did he have some sort of autism? He was or... a special needs. He was on a uh, an individual education plan, and 
It's sad because he came to Columbine, I think, in February, and then shootings happened. But his parents were so supportive, and the parents, like the Flemings and Mausers, and uh, all of them were so many of them were supportive. If you ever get a chance, I uh, published a book, and it's called "They Call Me Mr. D," and it really talks about the journey. It's called "They Call Me Mr. D: Story of Columbine's Heart, Resilience, Hope, and Recovery." In the last chapter in that book, I checked with the parents and all of them wrote something about their kids. And that last chapter talks about everything they wrote about. Them. So it really talks about that journey, you know, I went through, but uh, they have it on Amazon and it's, it, it really is my journey. And so, Oh, that's amazing. I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you, have you ever thought of writing a book? So you have. I, I waited. I did not do a whole lot. Uh, until I retired, I had been offered to do all these things. I said, no, my number one priority is getting these kids through school. And then once I retired, someone had asked me, someone that I had known asked me back. And I said, the last thing on my mind is writing a book. So when I retired about a year later, I said, are you still interested? She said, yes. So we produced this book. And it's really, it talks about not necessarily me, but how these kids came through and everything we went through. And it's a, a story of hope. And uh, it really, it's, it helps. Yes, it is. It does. And I'm sure that's going to help everyone. And what I, I hope I can do, buy this book, read it, and offer it to my school, because I think people should read this. So uh, I think it's helpful from that. And I know a lot of times when I go out and talk to schools, uh, I was just recently at the beginning of the school year, uh, two places I went to, uh, gosh, let me think. I went to New York and I went to somewhere, where was the other? Well, it was where one of my former students was in uh, West Plains, Missouri. And they bought the book for all of their staff, everyone in the district. And they gave that to their teachers to read because, it, and they said, and I received some nice comments that it was very uh, helpful, inspirational, no matter how tough times get, there's always hope. There is, you know, uh, my husband is, is um, you know, is Christian. He's not Catholic, but he's Christian. But he always says, when is life, there's hope. What do you think about that quote? Or oh, I mean, I'm sure that's in the Bible. But what do you think about it? when is life, there's hope? It is. You can't ever give up hope. And even on the toughest times. And, you know, and I, I truly, I mean, I think when things are going well, people are saying, yes, 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 it's fine. It's me. But. When times are tough, they turn to God and God's going to be there, you know, during the good times and the bad times. And, you know, just as I'm embarrassed to say, I was questioning God, but God was there. Mm -hmm. You know, someone, it's tough. And, you know, I can't imagine I didn't lose a, a, a child like, you know, Mr. Mauser and Mrs. Mauser lost a child. And, you know, and I know they were strong Christians. I'm not sure where they are right now because I don't know. I, for me, and some people break away and others, but I just, I'm looking at 25 years and I would not have been able to do this journey if it wasn't for my faith. No, that's, that's fantastic. And I'm sure you still got your family around that supports you. And that was there, then they supported you as well, because it must have been really an awful moment to go through, but you pulled through. I like that. I've seen a lot of, you know, aftermath, a lot of videos about you and some former students um, I, any former students still get in touch with you? Oh, they, they always check in on me. A lot of times when there's these other shootings, they check in and text me, Mr. D, how you doing? Uh, on Facebook, uh, I'm not a big social media, but I have probably over 4,000 of my former students on Facebook and we stay connected and I wish them happy birthday when their oh. birthdays come up. And so... One of the things that, I mean, there are some of these kids, I call them kids, but I started when I was 23, they're 60 years old. And when they see me, they still call me Mr. D or Coach D, you know, and it's like my coach, Mr. They, his, uh, Mr. Dittman. And I've been out of high school now, 71 years. And he said, you can call me Chris. I said, I can't call you Chris. You're always going to be Mr. Dittman or Coach Dittman. And when I'm walking down, I was at a game a few months ago and a kid who was one of my students uh, comes up and all of a sudden I hear someone yelling, Mr. D, Mr. D. And it's one of my kids. And here he is a 35 year old or 40 year old adult. And so that's what keeps it all worthwhile. And every year my wife and I, 
get invited eight or nine weddings of former students. Oh. And, and I walk in to just see them, you know, that they thought enough of me that they invited me to their wedding. And it's just, it, it, yeah, I, I've been lucky. Yes. The worst day of my life. And I look at it and, and I look at it, and as I stated, every day I recite the names of those, my beloved 13, and they give me the reason to continue. And there's times when I'm bad and I just look up and just say, give me some direction. And yes. they, have not, they have not let me down. And I'm I do sure. share something. Uh, I'm going to see if I can show you this picture in a second. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and I'll get it off my wall. But I was presenting there was a conference here in Colorado and there was about 2000 school resource officers. So I was a keynote presenter. And then also presenting was Michelle Gay. Her daughter, Joey was killed at Sandy Hook. So we do some work together. So presented out at the hotel and all of a sudden we're going to go to the memorial and they want me to just share some words and then they would walk around the memorial memorial. So we go and Michelle Gay's talking, but it is lightning. I mean, it is dark. And the director said, is it safe? And I said, oh, let's hold on a second. So Michelle's talking. I mean, it's dark. It's overcast. It's raining. And people are kind of shaking. And so Michelle speaks and then turns it over to me. And Don Anna, who's Lauren Townsend's mom, back in 2006, President Clinton came here to break ground for the memorial. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the statements that uh, Don Anna stated, she said, they're here. Can you feel them? Our angels. So she made that statement. So when I'm getting ready to present to the group of police officers that were there, I said that. I said, they're here. Can you feel them? Our angels. And I recited the names of the 13. And when I finished, there's a rainbow and sunshine. Let me show you this picture. Please, please. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Oh, and it's been captured as well. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Oh, this is so After beautiful. I spoke and said that, that rainbow appeared and there was skies opened up. That's so beautiful. Uh, I, really, I like that because somebody in media, when you have a moment to capture something that you might not see, that's fantastic. Yeah, like you said, they're always there. You know, they're not physically there, but they're always going to be there. It's not. You know, and it just, it brought, I mean, we have police officers a lot of times are really, you know, they're tough, tough, tough. And I mean, people are crying and that rainbow is there. And when I go out and present and share that, there's two things. And one of the things, you know, that uh, those kids wrote from the school I just visited, I told them the key story. And almost every kid said, oh, my gosh, God was there holding your hand to get that key in. And so that's where yeah. we are. And it's also uh, there was one song that some students did. Uh, Columbine, friend of mine. Yes, I John love... and Stephen Cohen. I Jonathan love... and Stephen Cohen, Columbine, friend of mine. Yeah. I love then, that song. Yeah, it is. Time I heard it, I think it was the 10th anniversary, because I remember when I was in Switzerland, I saw what's happening in Columbine. And then. The tenth anniversary, I read that. I, I heard that song, and I cried. My husband was like, "What's wrong? Why are you crying? Were you there? Do you know any of these people?" I said, but, "I said to my husband, but listen, I followed that story. The, those people were my age, so I said that it's, it's it's way to say, but I feel like I'm part of what's happening. That's why I've been insisting on talking to you because really and truly, I followed not like as being you know curious, but it really it really." Touch me the way you guys go together. You've been really the solidarity. I loved it. Like I spoke to Tom Miles, I, I love that sense of community. You know, that frankly, I, I, I just love the way you guys come together. The love. Well, the, the, the Mausers are good, dear friends of mine. They are really good friends. And like I said, I know them through church and we stay in contact and they're very special people as all the parents are. So, well, I appreciate that and everything today. So I got to get going. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for your time. That and, seems... I'll, you know, we can keep in touch. But if any time you come to the UK, please let me know. I would I like to see that. 
And I hope the the, the response is good on this. Thank you. Thank you, if you sir. Get the book, let me know what you think. Definitely. <laughs> Bye-bye, Mr. Bye. D. Bye-bye. Thank you.